Well, good morning. It's so wonderful to be with you today, and thank you so much for making time uh, to be here at worship. Uh, if you're visiting with us, we're especially glad that you're here, and we encourage you to drop a card in the offering plate just to let us get a record of attendance for you being here today. Um, remember, we do have a fellowship meal uh, right after worship service this morning, and then uh, after that, we'll have our devotional here in the uh, auditorium, and then we won't have an evening service tonight. Just a reminder on that. Uh, there is a new car brigade list out, so I wanted to remind you there. And um, one of the folks on the car brigade list uh, is Chad Taylor, um, young husband and father of two children, member of the Parkway <laughs> congregation in Kentucky, where the Hester's oldest son preaches. He was diagnosed recently with an inoperable malignant brain tumor. So please be praying for Chad Taylor. Um, and also car brigade as well. Uh, there's a, all right. Just a reminder also about the Luau, Saturday, June the 4th, uh, from 1 to 3 p.m., or 1300 to 1500, uh, here at the church building. Uh, looking forward to having a great time, good food, and lots of fun. So looking forward to that event next Saturday. Please remember Tommy and Sabrina Stover's grandson, um, who has tested positive for COVID. Uh, please um, remember them. Also, Molly, Molly's here today, right? Okay, please pray for Molly. She a, has a bad earache, so um, those can be very painful. So please pray for Molly. And also remember Gideon too. Gideon's not feeling well today, so he has a, he has a fever, I think, at home. So please remember Gideon and India. Um, and I would like to invite everyone, uh, you know, if you didn't have time, if, if you haven't been to Bible class Sunday morning recently, we would encourage you to come back next week in the auditorium. We're having a class starting on human suffering. It's such a wonderful topic. Um, also, the summer series for um, on Wednesday night is starting this Wednesday. Uh, so if you haven't been to Wednesday night in a while, we'd love to have you come. Uh, Wednesday night summer series in here. Also, we have wonderful Wednesday. Uh, for the children um, in the fellowship hall, and that starts this Wednesday as well. We'd love to have you be a part of that. Have I missed any announcements? Okay, her daughter-in-law. Daughter so, daughter Sister Albright's daughter-in-law is is having some help. Having a lot of health issues and is, is back in rehab, so please remember her uh, in your prayers as well. Any other announcements on this? All right, uh, please join us in our worship. Good morning. 424 will be our first song this morning. Paradise Valley will sing the first and the last stanza of this song. First and the last. As I travel through life with its trouble and strife, I have a glorious hope to give cheer on the way. Soon my toil will be o'er, and I'll rest on that shore where the night has been turned into day. Up in the beautiful paradise valley by the side of the river of life. Up in the valley, the wonderful valley will be free from all pain and all strife. There we shall live in the rose-tinted garden, neath the shade of the evergreen tree. How I long for the paradise valley, where the beauty of heaven I'll see. Though your garden is rare, it is not to compare with the flowers that bloom in the garden above. In the midst of it grows Sharon's perfect sweet rose. Tis the wonderful flower we love. Up in the beautiful paradise valley by the side of the river of life. 
up in the valley, the wonderful valley will be free from all pain and all strife. There we shall live in the rose-tinted garden neath the shade of the evergreen tree. How I long for the paradise valley where the beauty of heaven I'll see. Before prayer this uh, morning, 425, Where Could I Go? We'll again sing the first and the last stanzas of this song. 425. Living below in this old sinful world, hardly a comfort can afford striving alone to face temptation sore where could i go but to the lord where could i go oh where could i go seeking a refuge for my soul to save me in the end where could i go but to the lord life here is grand with friends i love so dear comfort i get from god's own word yet when i face the chilling hand of death to the Lord. Where could I go? Oh, where could I go? Seeking a refuge for my soul. Needing a friend to save me in the end. Where could I go but to the Bow with me, please. Our Father and our God in heaven, Father, we're just so thankful that we can come together this morning as we are at this time to worship and praise your holy name. And Father, to remember always in, the, in all our lives the song that we just sang. And we know that you're always near us if we'll do our part to to stay near you and you are our only way that we can go and we're so thankful we're so thankful for all the love that you've shown us we're thankful for our congregation here at Elmore and for all the members of this congregation that are followers of yours and for not only these but throughout the world it's true followers of yours and doing everything they can to live for you Father, we're thankful for all the missionaries and all the work that they do in your name. And we know that from some of the things that we've heard from some of them, never done any of that traveling like they have and have to do, that it's, it can be very hard on them. But they are doing your will and working for you, and we're just so thankful and we Pray that things will go with them wherever they are, that they'll always be successful in teaching your word. Father, we're thankful for our assembly this morning. We're thankful for our visitors that we have with us, and we just pray that you'll help us as we worship you at this time, that, uh, that our worship service will be truly acceptable to you. Father, we pray you'd forgive us of anything that's wrong in our lives, that we may do our best to stand strong with you. Father, we ask you to help all of those that are sick and suffering and facing so many problems. And Lord, all the ones that Brother Andrew mentioned and ones that we all know of in our own 
uh, friends or families or whoever that's suffering and facing problems. So please help them all, Father. We're just so blessed and we think about the, uh, the medical fields and all that we have that you've allowed mankind to develop from your creation. And Father, everything that we have, we know it came from your creation and you give us so much. And may we think on these things and not take so many of them for granted, but to praise your name and thank you for all that you've done for us and doing for us every day through your son, Jesus. We're just so thankful that he was willing to come to this earth for the, for the life that he lived here. Father, we know everything he did. Your word tells us what he did. He was doing it for mankind. He done it to help us to see the way, to know the way, because he is the way. And we must do our best to follow that. And we're thankful for the church that he established to give us this Christian family here on this earth while we're here. So we can be an encouragement to each other and that we can encourage those that are not following your way the best we can to, to see the need by using your word, and it all comes from your word. You must ever realize that you were so great to us to allow mankind to put that word down where we can have it to read it and study it, but we must use it the best we can, and may we do so always. And Father, thank you especially for the greatest love that was ever shown for mankind was when your son was willing to give his life on that cross for our sins. Father, your word tells us that through his death, burial, and resurrection that the, that hope is set up and is there forever for all mankind. But all mankind must realize, and we all must realize, that we must be obedient to that word, to obey it, to be buried with your son in, in baptism, and to do our best every day to walk our, in our lives the way that's acceptable to you. And may we do our best to do that. Father, we pray that you would be with those that are traveling away from us this morning. We know that... Brother Scott and Mr. Sherry, we pray you be with them. We pray you be with Brother Charlie Bide as he brings us a lesson this morning. And we know it's from your word, and we just pray we'll take these things he tells us and to use them in our lives the best we can. Father, all things we pray through your great and wonderful Son, Jesus. His holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Brother Bass. The prayer mind is taking the Lord's Supper this morning, number six. Alas, and did my Savior bleed? Number six. We'll again sing the first and the last stanza of this song. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a one as I. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. But drops of grief can never repay the debt of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself away. Tis all that I can do. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day.
If you've got your Bibles, uh, you can turn with me to Hebrews chapter 9. We'll be reading from there. I was studying this last night, and it's amazing, the two covenants that we read about in the Bible, about the old covenant that, was, uh, that the Jewish nation was under, and, and then the new covenant that we're now under. And, and we'll read about that right now in, in Hebrews chapter 9, starting in verse 11. It says, But when Christ came as the high priest of the good things we now have, he entered the greater and more perfect tent. It is not made by humans and does not belong to this world. Christ entered the most holy place only once and for all time. He did not take with him the blood of goats and calves. His sacrifice was his own blood, and by it he set us free from sin forever. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a cow are sprinkled on the people who are unclean, and this makes their bodies clean again. How much more is done by the blood of Christ? He offered himself through the eternal spirit as a perfect sacrifice to God. His blood will make our consciences, consciences pure from use, useless acts so that may, we may serve the living God. That's, that's a wonderful thing to know that, that Christ's blood now redeems us because of his sacrifice we can now fellowship with God and be with him in eternity in heaven. Pray with me, please. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we just uh, we thank you for your love and the love of your Son that he was willing to come down to earth and to die for us and to wash away our sins through his blood and that the body that was hung on the cross, Lord, we just pray that you would uh, be with us as we partake of this bread that represents that body and may we take of it in a way that is pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this sacrifice that your son was willing to give on the cross of Calvary. When we know that without, without the shedding of his blood that we would have no chance of uh, eternity with you, Lord. And we just thank you for that sacrifice. And may we take over this fruit of the vine in a pleasing manner. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
that concludes the Lord's Supper. Now we have an opportunity to give back, which uh, the Lord has given us. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for uh, uh, richly blessing this this nation that we live in, Lord. We give, uh, we're given so much here in America, and we just thank you for that. Uh, let us not take it for granted, all the, all the rich blessings that you provide us, Lord. And may we uh, give back that portion that which you, uh, you've given us so that we can uh, spread your word and uh, increase the kingdom of heaven, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Psalm for the lesson this morning will be number, if you care to mark it, 657 will be the song of invitation. Of course, it'll be available on the board. Thanks to our talented IT team. Uh, psalm before the lesson will be number 182. Hide me, rock of ages. We'll sing the first and the last stanza of this song. If you would, please stand. Our lesson for this morning is in the form of a question, have you really been baptized? I'm aware of the fact that there are those in the religious world who would not like for us to preach on baptism, and they sometimes say, you preachers in the Church of Christ always preach on baptism. Well, that is not the case, really. I have never in my lifetime of preaching the gospel always preached on baptism. But some folks think that is the case, and I've heard that fictitious story about the preacher who always preached on water baptism every time he got up to preach. And the elders then decided they would just give him a passage on which to preach, and surely he couldn't preach on baptism with that passage. He got up to preach and said, my text is Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth is three-fourths water, and that brings me to my text for this morning, water baptism. Well, that's a fictitious story, and no doubt uh, 
made by those who do not believe in baptism. I don't know any gospel preacher who always preaches on baptism. I do preach on baptism, and every gospel preacher does. I would not be a gospel preacher if I did not preach on it, because Christ commands us to do it. In the Great Commission, in Mark 16, 16, he said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. In the previous verse, he said to go and preach it. So we are commanded to do that. Now, you may assume that I'm going to be talking then to those who are not members of the church and those who have never been baptized, but that would be a mistake as well. Now, I want to talk to all of those who are accountable, of accountable age, because it's possible for one to think that he has been baptized when in reality he has not. I was preaching in a gospel meeting up in Johnstown, Pennsylvania one time, not too long ago. And I preached on this very topic. Have you really been baptized? When I offered the invitation, no one responded to the invitation. But before the people left the building, one of the men came to the preacher there and said, I need to be baptized. He had come to realize from that lesson that he had not really been baptized. And it's possible for one of us to be in that condition or position. Have you ever had the experience of failing to renew your driver's license at a certain time. I have. Possibly some of you have had that experience. Now, I knew the law about it. I intended to obey God's or man's law about the driver's license being renewed. And, in fact, I thought I had done it. But something happened, and I realized that I had not really renewed my driver's license, though I thought I had. It is possible for one to believe that he has been baptized when in reality he has not been. So the truthfulness of this lesson today can be the difference between going to heaven and going to the other place, between obeying God and disobeying God. And I would hate for us to miss an opportunity to teach someone who may think he's been baptized when he has not really been baptized and then to lose his soul. And so the Bible tells us to go and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Have you really been baptized? Now, we have two points to our lesson this morning. There are two questions we need to ask in order to answer that basic question. Number one, have you been baptized for the right reason? or the right purpose. The Bible tells us why we are to be baptized. And the Bible tells us that Christ commands us to do it. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them. We are commanded to be baptized. The New Testament teaches us that baptism is an act of obedience to the command of our Lord. It is not just a dipping in water, not just an immersion in water. Some people think that's what it is. I was in a Bible study with a man down in Wildwood, Florida on one occasion, and we were studying about the Bible and what it teaches about how to be saved. And we talked about baptism, a part of God's plan for salvation. He said, I don't understand how being dipped in the water has anything to do with salvation. He said, baptism is just a dipping in the water. He said, a frog is baptized every time he jumps into the water, if that's all it is. I explained to him that God had not commanded frogs to be baptized. He commanded human beings to be baptized, and it is an act of obedience to the command of our Lord. If we do not obey the Lord, then there can be no salvation. Now, I heard Brother Leroy Brownlow preach on several occasions. He was a great gospel preacher from the past. I heard him at the Freed Harmon Lectures on one occasion. You probably heard it too. He said a man uh, broke into their building one night to burglarize the building. He couldn't turn on the lights because people might see him in there. He couldn't use a flashlight. The light might be seen through the window. He was just wandering through the building searching for something to steal. He opened one door and walked right into the baptistry, fell right into the baptistry. <laughs> they could tell that's what happened because where he came up out of the baptistry, there was a big puddle of water and there were steps of water throughout the building where he had gone. Now, if baptism is just a dipping in the water, the Lord got a new member that night. 
Did that man become a Christian? Was he baptized? Certainly not. Because baptism is not just a dipping in the water. It is an act of obedience to the command of our Lord. We are baptized to get into Christ. In Galatians 3, 26 and 27, the Scripture says, We are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Baptism puts us into Christ. Until we are baptized into Him, we're not in Him. When you got out of your car this morning and walked to this building, you took several steps unto this building. But you're not yet in the building. But when you came to the door and took that one step into the building, then you were in the building. Now, there are several steps that one takes to come unto Christ. We must believe in Christ, John 8, 24. Except you believe that I am He, you shall die in your sins. We must repent of our sins, Acts 2, 38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And so we are to repent, but we're still not in Christ. When we believe, we were not yet in Christ. And then one must confess his faith in Christ. In Romans 10 and 10, the Bible says, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. We're not in Christ yet when we confess our faith. But when we are baptized, we are baptized into Christ. After we have been baptized, we are children of God, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. Romans 8, verse 17. And so we are baptized into Christ. We must be baptized for that purpose, to get into the family of God. We're baptized into Christ. Then when we are baptized, we receive the Holy Spirit. In that passage we noted in Acts 2.38, Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit is not given to just anybody and everybody. The Holy Spirit is given to those who obey the gospel of Christ by being baptized into Christ. Now the Bible tells us why we are to be baptized. And when we're baptized, it ought to be for that Bible purpose. Baptism is for the remission of sins. In the passage noted in Acts 2.38, Peter said, for the remission of sins. That word for means in order to obtain the remission of sins. It is to remit our sins, remove our sins. In Acts 22.17, when Paul recounted his conversion, he said, Down and Ananias, the preacher, came to him and said, now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized. Wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now that passage tells us when our sins are washed away. In verse 5, the Bible tells us what washes away our sins. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. What washes away our sins? The blood of Christ. When does the blood of Christ wash away our sins? Acts 22, 17 tells us when we're baptized into Christ. So you see, baptism is for a purpose. It is to remit or remove our sins or wash away our sins. Now, unless a person is baptized to wash away his sins, he really isn't baptized. I was preaching down in Mobile, and a lady responded to the invitation. And she said, years ago I went through what I thought was baptism. I was baptized in that way. But I was not baptized for the remission of sins. I didn't realize that I was lost and that I needed to be baptized to have my sins removed. But she says, now that I know the baptism is for the remission of sins, I want to be baptized. I commended her for it. The authority for doing that is in Acts 19, 1 through 7. When Paul found... Twelve men at Ephesus who had been baptized, they were not baptized according to the baptism of Christ. And so he taught them and then baptized them according to the baptism of Christ. So when a person has not been baptized properly, that is the scripture that suggests that he needs to be baptized according to the baptism of Christ. So baptism is to save us. In 1 Peter 3.21, Peter said, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, 
but the answer of a good conscience toward God. Now, baptism is not to wash away the dirt of the body, but it is to cleanse us of the sins of the soul. The Bible tells us there is none righteous, no, not one, Romans 3 and 10. In verse 23, he said, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That includes everybody. Until a person comes to Christ to have his sins washed away, he is a sinner and he's lost, separated from God. In Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2, the Bible says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save, neither his ear heavy that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have turned his face from you that he will not hear. And so sin separates us from God. But the Lord loves us through his grace and mercy. He has given us a plan by which our sins can be removed. When we obey the gospel of Christ, culminating in being baptized into Christ, then our sins are washed away. When we have our sins washed away, we begin to live a new life. We've been born again. In John 3 and 3, Jesus said, Except a man be born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Verse 5, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And so a person must be baptized or born again into the family of God, and at that point, he is cleansed of all sin and begins to live a new life, a life in which he is in a saved condition. In Romans 6 and 4, Paul said, Therefore we were buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. When we're baptized into Christ, we're born again, and we begin to live a new life, a sinless life. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Paul tells us that when we're in Christ, we are new creatures. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, therefore all things are become new. And so in baptism, we enter into a new life, a saved life. Our past sins have been washed away. But someone may ask, why would anyone be baptized if not for those scriptural reasons? Well, I can tell you five reasons that I remember that might prompt a person to go through what he thinks is baptism, none of which is taught in the Bible. Are you listening? Number one, one may think he has been baptized because he wants to please a mate or catch a mate. I was preaching for a congregation years ago and one of the ladies in the congregation came to see me at the office one day and said, I want to be baptized. I thought she had been baptized. The members who knew her thought she had been baptized. But she said, back before we married, I was not a New Testament Christian. I'd never been baptized for the remission of sins. But I knew that Bill would not marry me unless I had been baptized. <laughs> so she said, I was baptized to get him to marry me. Now, folks, I don't read about that in the Bible. That's not a purpose for being baptized. And so I commended her for it, and I baptized her into Christ for the remission of sins. Remember Acts 19, 1 through 7? We haven't been baptized properly. We need to be baptized properly. And then sometimes people are baptized to follow their friends. I have talked to a number of people and rebaptized a number of people in my lifetime. I have had them to tell me back when they thought they were baptized, they were very young, and they said they were not really doing it because they thought they were lost and in being baptized they would be saved from sin. They said they did it to follow their friend. Sometimes people are baptized when they're very young to follow a friend, not because they believe they're lost and they, they need to be baptized to be saved, but to follow their friend. And so that would not be taught in the Bible either. Number three, some have been baptized, I'm told, to seek a social or business advantage. Scott mentioned this the other day in a sermon. One may be baptized, become a member of a church, thinking that the people there would give him their business, maybe buy insurance from them. That's not taught in the Bible. We're not to be baptized because it would be advantageous to us from a business standpoint or from a social standpoint. We just want to be a part of a crowd, but we don't really believe that we were lost, and that in obeying 
Christ in baptism, we would be saved from sin. Number four, a person may be baptized in order to become a member of a human organization. Through the years, human beings have started different churches. And those are not the churches of the New Testament. They are opposed to what the Bible teaches, and they are opposed to other denominational churches. That's what makes them different. Some people make baptism an initiation into their organization. They claim to be a church, religious organization, but they make that a stipulation. You have to be baptized into it. Well, the Bible doesn't teach us to be baptized into a man-made organization. We're to be baptized into Christ, and when we do that, we're baptized into his body. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. And so when a person is baptized to become a member of a man-made institution, he's not doing what the Bible says. He's not obeying the Lord. Sometimes people are baptized because they believe they're already saved. There are some folks in the religious world who are honest and sincere people. They really are. They want to do right. But they teach that a person is saved by faith only. At the point he believes in the Lord, he's saved from sin. Well, now, friends, that's not what the Bible tells us. Faith alone will not save a person. Brother Marshall Kiba was a great black preacher, probably the best known preacher in our brotherhood during his lifetime. He had the unusual ability to put the hay down where the calves could reach it. <laughs> you could understand what he was saying. He said, uh, if you believe that you were saved before you were baptized, you're too fast. God never dry cleaned a man since his son died on Calvary. You put God in the dry cleaning business if you have him saved before he's baptized in water. Well, now that puts it down so I can understand it. <laughs> We're not to be baptized for any other reason other than that which the Lord taught. He didn't teach us to be baptized because we're already saved. He taught us to be baptized in order to be saved. And so, you see, I've given five reasons why some people may be baptized at least they think they've been baptized, but they have not been baptized according to the Bible. The question is, have you really been baptized? Have you been baptized for a scriptural reason, the ones that we gave you from the Bible? Now, there are some who have been baptized according to what they have been taught, and they believe later that they were baptized properly. Sometimes a person is baptized at some point, and he's been taught that he's being baptized to show he's already saved by faith only. And then later, he begins to think that he was baptized for the remission of sins because he's heard a preacher preach what the Bible says, we're to be baptized in order to be saved. And this person assumes that he or she was baptized for that reason when he was baptized earlier. I was in a Bible study with a later lady on one occasion, and we talked about God's plan of salvation, that a person is to be baptized in order to be saved. And she said, I was baptized for the remission of sins. Well, I knew the church of which she was a member did not teach that one is baptized for the remission of sins, but rather they're saved by their faith alone. They later teach a person to be baptized to show that he's already saved. That's not what the Bible teaches. And so a person may be baptized thinking that he was baptized properly because he was taught later and he understands later that he was baptized to be baptized for the remission of sins. But when he was baptized or she was baptized, she was not. I was studying with this lady and she said she'd been baptized for the remission of sins. And I said, would you do me a favor? Would you go into your phone and, and call your preacher and ask him, if he had baptized you for the remission of sins. She said, okay, I'll do it. She went and called him and came back to me and said, no, he didn't baptize me for the remission of sins. He said, we're saved by faith only. Later, she heard somebody preach what the Bible teaches, that we're saved to be saved, or baptized to be saved, and she assumed that's what she was doing when she was baptized. Sometimes people think they're baptized when they have not really been. So have you been baptized 
for the right reason. The second is, have you been baptized in the right way? If you go to your dictionary, you'll find that it says that baptism is sprinkling, pouring, or immersion. But that's not what the Bible says. A dictionary defines words as people commonly use them. It doesn't define the word as God used it in the Bible. The Bible does not use the term baptism to mean sprinkling or pouring. But the word simply means to dip, to plunge, to bury, or to immerse. Now, the Bible uses the term in that way in every case where you read it. It is a word that means to dip, to plunge, to bury, or to immerse. I read about a woman some years ago who was a member of a church that practiced sprinkling for baptism. She had a friend who was a member of the New Testament church, and this friend invited her to come to a gospel meeting. And the preacher was preaching that night on the conversion of, of the eunuch in Acts 8, beginning with verse 26. She heard the preacher read the scripture. When the uh, preacher, Philip, ran to the chariot and heard the reading from Isaiah the prophet and asked, Understandest thou what thou readest? And the eunuch said, How can I except some man should guide me? And he desired that Philip should get into the chariot with him and help him to understand. Philip got into that chariot and began at that scripture in Isaiah 53 and preached unto him Jesus. In preaching Jesus to him, he had to preach what Jesus said to do to be saved. So, after a while, after Philip had taught him, that eunuch said, See, here is water. What does hinder me to be baptized? They came to a certain water, the Bible tells us. And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more. This lady who had been sprinkled was concerned because she had only been sprinkled. And she saw that the Bible teaches that it is an immersion in water. She went to talk to her preacher about it and told him that she had heard this preacher preach about Philip and the eunuch and it shows that it was a burial in water. And she said, I've only been sprinkled. And her preacher said, well, you must also understand that the Bible says it was desert. And in a desert, they didn't have a pond or a baptismal pool or spring or a river. And so as they were riding along, and Philip taught him that he needed to be baptized, the eunuch knew he was going to be crossing the desert, so he brought along a jug of water. He reached under his seat and pulled out a jug of water and said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Now think about that. And she said, Oh, I see. And they both went down into the jug, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the jug, the Spirit of the Lord called away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more. That won't work, will it? That's not what the Bible says. They came to a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Philip asked him if he believed. He said he did. They went down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, you see, baptism is a going down into the water, being buried, and then coming up out of the water. In Matthew 3.16, we read that after Jesus was baptized, he came up out of the water. What was he doing down in the water? He was being baptized. After being baptized, he came up out of the water. Baptism is an immersion in water. It is not sprinkling. It isn't pouring water on one. In John 3, the Bible tells us, verse 23, that John was baptizing in Enon near to Salem because there was much water there. It doesn't take much water to sprinkle some water on a person. You can do that with a thimble. It doesn't take much water to pour water on him. You can use a thimble or a cup and pour a little water on it. But he's not being baptized. Baptism is an immersion in water. I remember studying with a lady on one occasion who was not a New Testament Christian, and she was dying of cancer. Her husband worked with one of our members, and he set up a Bible study for us, went and studied with her. At the conclusion of that study, I said, uh, 
you would like to be baptized for the remission of sins and become a child of God, we can take you to our building right now. We have a baptistry there in the building. We have clothing to be used, and you can be baptized tonight. Her husband didn't know anything about the Bible. He said, why can't we just take her into our bathroom here and turn the shower on, put her in the shower, and, and baptize her? And so I explained to him again, the baptism is an immersion in water. It is not sprinkling water on someone. Baptism is an immersion. I have an article here with a picture taken from the Montgomery Advertiser that pictures a number of people out on the parking lot outside a church building. And it pictures a man, presumably the preacher, who had a big water hose. It was not a little garden hose. It was a big fire hose. You can see the water coming out of that thing about that big in the spout. And he calls it fire hose baptism. He was shooting that water into the air, and it was falling on those people, and they thought they were being baptized. How tragic when good, honest, sincere people do not read the Bible and accept what it says. Baptism is a burial, burial in water. Now, I have baptized people in their bathroom, but in the bathtub. When we first went to Russia up in Eta, we baptized 75 people there. All of them were baptized in a bathtub. The rivers and ponds were all frozen over there. You couldn't get into the water. So we filled a bathtub with water, and we baptized 75 people but we buried them in the water. Baptism is a burial or an immersion in water. Now, Greek authorities, representing the various denominational churches, understand and agree, at least they have in the past, that baptism is an immersion. Martin Luther, whose teachings formed the basis for the beginning of the first Protestant denominational church, said, the term baptism is a Greek word. It may be rendered in Latin by mercio, when we immerse anything in water, that it may be entirely covered with it. If we're proper, these should be deeply immersed who are baptized. Now, Martin Luther said it's a barrel in water. His followers today don't follow his teaching on that point. John Calvin, whose teachings formed the basis for the beginning of another prominent denominational church, not the church of the New Testament, John Calvin said, It is evident that the term baptize means to immerse and that this was the form used by the ancient church. His followers don't follow his teaching on that. They sprinkle. John Wesley, whose teachings formed the basis of another church that man established. And John Wesley comments on Romans 6 and 4, where Paul said, therefore, we were buried with him by baptism in the death. He said, we were buried with him, alluding to the ancient method or manner of baptizing by immersion. John Wesley taught that baptism in the Bible was an immersion. His followers today don't practice what he taught on that point. J.D. Tant was a gospel preacher that over 100 years ago, and he was debating a denominational preacher on the mode of baptism. Brother Tant was speaking, and he said Christ was baptized in the Jordan River. Other people were baptized in the Jordan River. They were immersed in the Jordan River. And when that denominational preacher got up to speak, he said, why, nobody could be immersed in the Jordan River. That, that's just a little stream. He said, I could dam up the Jordan River with my foot. When Brother Tant got up to speak, he said, All of my life I've wanted to go to Palestine to see the Jordan River, but I'd travel a whole lot farther to see that foot. <laughs> that would be some foot to dam up the Jordan River. The Jordan River was big enough to baptize people. Our preacher here, Scott Gleaves, has been there, and he can tell you it's a river. His youngest daughter, Taylor, our granddaughter, went with a group of students from Harding overseas to study, and they went there, and she waded out in the Jordan River. Anybody who's been there can tell you it's a river. People can be baptized in it. Baptism is an immersion. It is not sprinkling. Now, if you have been sprinkled or just been had water poured on you, 
you really haven't obeyed the Bible, haven't been baptized properly. Someone may say, when I was young, I was baptized, and they mean they were christened, as that term is used. And that doesn't mean they were buried in water. They had water sprinkled on them. They're usually against it. They're usually kicking and screaming. <laughs> They're against it. But this person says, I was christened when I was young. Am I all right? Let me ask a question too, and you can answer your own question. What were the prere prerequisites for a person to be baptized? What did he need to do before he's baptized? He would have to believe. Remember the preacher Philip asked the eunuch, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. Can a baby believe? Surely not. Second, a person must repent of his sins. Peter said on, in Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized. Can a baby repent? No. A baby doesn't need to repent. A little baby is sinless and pure. We've got some little babies in this audience. Do you mean to tell me that those little babies need to be baptized and they're lost? No, no. They're just as pure as the driven snow. They have not sinned. They don't need to repent. And a little baby couldn't repent. Ask one of these little babies, will you repent? <laughs> that baby wouldn't know what you're talking about. The Bible teaches that a person must confess his faith in Christ. Romans 10 and 10. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Can a baby confess his faith in Christ? These little babies here couldn't do that. They don't need to. Little babies are sinless and pure. They're going to go to heaven today, die where, where they are right now. Little babies can't obey the gospel. Now, suppose a man who weighs 200 pounds respond to the invitation this morning. When I offer the invitation in a moment or two, and a big man, 200 pounds, comes forward, and I ask him, what is your desire? And he says, I want to be baptized. And I ask him, do you believe? you believe in Christ as the Son of God? And he says, no, I don't. Should I baptize him? No, no. You can't be baptized if you don't believe in Christ, God, or the Bible, or baptism. Suppose he weighs 100 pounds. Should I baptize him? No, no. Suppose he weighs 50 pounds. Should I baptize him? No. Suppose he weighs 10 pounds. Should I baptize him? Doesn't believe in Christ? Can't repent? Doesn't need to? Can't confess his faith in Christ? He weighs 10 pounds. I couldn't baptize him. Little babies cannot be baptized. And there's not a word in the Bible that teaches us to baptize little babies. Baptism is for those who can understand, who are old enough to understand right and wrong and understand God's will. Have you been baptized in the right way? Our question, the basic question is, have you really been baptized? Have you been baptized for the right reason? Have you been baptized in the right way? A few years ago, I filled in at Lightwood up the road here where Brother Taylor used to preach. Jerry Martin was preaching there then, and he asked me to come and preach for him several times. And on one of those occasions, I preach this sermon. Have you really been baptized? When the invitation was extended, no one responded. But the next day, one of the elders in that congregation called me and said, Charlie, we thought you would like to know that we baptized so-and-so after that lesson yesterday. This person thought about it, evaluated it in terms of the Bible, and he came to realize that he had not been baptized. And so he was baptized then. I've met a number of people who've done that. It may be that in the audience today, there's someone who has been honest and sincere, and you've known God's will about baptism. You intended to obey his will. You thought you had obeyed his will. But after this study, maybe you've seen that you haven't really been baptized. We're going to give you an opportunity to do that. When we stand to sing this invitation song, come down to the front, and we'd be glad to assist you and baptize you into Christ in this very hour. You can go home a Christian. 
You can pillow your head tonight in peaceful rest that should you not awaken tomorrow, you'd go home to be with God. You don't want to miss that opportunity. You need to make it as sure as you can. If you realize that you haven't really been baptized, won't you come down to the front and tell us right now while we stand and sing. Thank you, Brother Body. Great lesson. Appreciate each and every one of you being here this morning. Your presence here is greatly appreciated. Love each and every one of you and hope you'll stay with us to eat lunch. It'll be across the way. Just follow the, uh, the crowd. If you don't know how to get there, they will show you there. Now, we'll sing one final song, 339, more about Jesus. Then we'll be dismissed with a prayer. If you would, bless the food as well before we go over there. Hope you'll be back. Stay with us for our Devo. And then remember, we won't have services tonight. 339, we'll sing the first stanza of this song and then we'll be dismissed with a prayer. More about Jesus would I know, more of his grace to others show, more of his saving fullness see, more of his love for died for me. More, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus. More of his saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me. Bow with me, please. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come together as your children and celebrate your word. Father, we ask that you use us to provide that bright light to shine into the world. And Father, we also ask that you bless the food that we are about to receive, that it go to the nourishment of our bodies and our bodies in your service. In Christ's name, amen. <laughs>